So I know this title is pretty provocative. Martin Luther, you would hate this guy. Um, I really do believe that uh, if he were in our day, he would be very much despised. And that is that is the nature of reformers. Uh, people don't like them. They think outside the box. And uh, I will prove to you why you would hate this guy if he lived in our day. Now, I had a somebody on one of my videos about seven months ago that uh, recommended that I read this book, Eric, or Martin Luther by Eric Metaxas. And I actually listened to it on Audible, and it was fantastic. And I took copious notes on this. And so I would be uh, pausing and uh, writing down notes and rewinding and, and doing things like that. But I just loved it. And the, um, to understand who this man was, who I thought I knew, uh, was pretty incredible. So I just want to share some of my thoughts after this book with you. And I think that you will find it very instructive. So please stick around until the end and uh, see if you really would hate him today. There's a quote, um, this famous quote, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And the ironic thing about this quote is that people think this is George uh, Orwell, or they think it is um, Winston Churchill, but uh, ironically, it's uh, George Satyana. And uh, this is from 1905. But we think that we remember history and we don't. And we think that we've got it right this time and we're doing the exact same thing as we've done in history. In the LDS Church, we uh, give shout outs to Martin Luther. Um, we give shout outs to the Reformation and say, we, we, you know, the, the, the restoration couldn't have happened without the Reformation. And so we love the Reformation. We love it. It's great. Martin Luther is a hero in the LDS Church and other churches, other Protestant churches at least. And uh, I actually love this quote from Lorenzo Snow, General Conference, 1857. We should not merely rest satisfied with the necessity of this reformation, but we should have the spirit of it within ourselves. I love this quote. Reformation, uh, there is a spirit that comes with a re reformation, and it is the spirit of God. Um, in fact, if you look in the Book of Commandments, now the Book of the Commandments was the precursor to the Doctrine of Covenants. In chapter 4 of the Book of Commandments, this came out in, I think, uh, 1833, and you can't find this in the Doctrine and Covenants, but this is a promise from God, and he says, And thus, if the people of this generation will harden not their hearts, I will work a reformation among them. God promises if we don't harden our hearts to work a reformation among us. So reformation, in general, is a godly thing. It's from God. It's what God wants of us. And, and how does he do that? He says, I will put down all lies and deceivings and priestcrafts and envyings and strifes and idolatries and sorceries and iniquities. Do we have any, any of those in the church today? And I will establish my church like unto the church which was taught by my disciples in the days of old. Next verse, he says, And now if this generation do, do harden their hearts out against my word, behold, I will deliver them up unto Satan. For he reigneth and hath power at this time, for he hath got great hold upon the hearts of the people of this generation. So it's either you reform or you're delivered up in Satan. There's no middle ground. Um, you try to sit on the fence, you're not going to. Um, God wants reformation. He, he loves reformation. And we're going to see that. Even in Jesus' time, I shouldn't say even, especially in Jesus' time, um, we read in John 8, then it said Jesus to the Jews, which believed on him, If you continue my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay, so if you're based in the word of God, um, then you will, and if you continue, that means if you act according to the word of God, then you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And then they, they answered, and they said, We be Abraham's seed, and we were never in bondage to any man. How saith thou, ye shall be made free? Then answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. We pay homage to Martin Luther. We say, oh, we love him. Great guy. Um, you know, we couldn't have the restoration without him. And yet, if there comes anybody with the spirit of Martin Luther, um, then we condemn them. And uh, Jesus would say to us in our day, if you, were Martin, if you really love Martin Luther, then you would do the works of Martin Luther. And we saw that in the Book of Commandments quote there. So I've claimed if Martin Luther was alive today, you would hate him and consider him a child of hell. 
which I do believe. Uh, so he was this lowly monk, and he just started asking uncomfortable questions. He was very quickly called a heretic. Uh, we would call him in our day an apostate. Um, we would say, oh yeah, he's been excommunicated, so he's dangerous, right? Because he would talk about things like money. Um, what, what does it mean to give offerings? Um, he's like, he talked about faith, the true defi definition of faith, the true definition of repentance, um, about scripture. Uh, there's the term sola scriptura, which we're going to talk about, which means scripture alone. Um, he, of necessity, had to, d to delve into understanding what, what keys were um, and the source of salvation. Does it come through the church or God? Um, he also, of necessity, had to delve into priesthood. Does Catholic Church have priesthood? What does that mean? What does priesthood mean? Um, ultimately, people would say, well, you're, you, you can't do this. You're questioning the Lord's anointed. And, ob and obviously that means you're questioning God. And we would say in our day, well, doesn't, don't the scriptures say by the, my, my own voice, the voice of my servants is the same. And I do get a lot of people that say that when, if I ask any question, they're like, wait a second, you can't, you cannot say that. Like, well, I can't ask a question. No, you're questioning God when you question the Lord's anointed. Um, and I think the, the problem is that we, that the, the leaders take this very personal and you're not questioning them, you're questioning doctrine. And that's what uh, Martin Luther ultimately was doing. I love this verse in these, these two verses in Ecclesiastes. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. He's saying the thing that has been in the past, it's going to happen again. And that which is done is that which shall be which shall be done. Again, same thing. That which has already been done is going to happen again. And there is no th new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new? It hath been already of old time. It hath been already of old time, which was before us. And we love to say, oh, we've got the restoration. We've got it right. We've got it perfect. We have all the keys. We have all the power. We have everything today. We're good. All we need to do is stay in the box, stay faithful, and we are, we have it. And so we don't, we have this pattern of not questioning anything. But Ecclesiastes is saying, um, what has already happened in the past is going to happen again. It probably is happening right now. Um, you think you have something new. It's not new. So you remember Martin Luther from uh, nailing 95 Thesis on the wall of a cathedral, right? So we're going to talk about that, but let's rewind. Martin Luther never had um, ambition originally to be a theologian, to be um, in a, a, a priest or a monk or anything like that in the Catholic Church. In fact, his his family wanted him to um, pick them out of the 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 drolls of society, and he was going. He went to the University of Erfurt to become a lawyer, and he was studying there and doing a great job um, in his younger years. This would be his early twenties. He was studying to be a lawyer, and one day when he was traveling between his hometown and Erfurt, um, there was a severe thunderstorm which scared the crap out of him with lightning like crazy coming down all around him. And as he was cowering and understanding that his life was a danger, he promised God, he said, if you will deliver me from this, I will become a monk and I will serve you. And the storm passed and Martin Luther being a man of his word, he actually went to the university and he checked out and said, I'm gone. I'm going to go um, and I'm going to become a monk. And so he enrolled in an Augustinian, um, he enrolled to be an Augustinian monk. A monk. And so uh, being a monk is not prestigious. It is very lowly. It is the lowest of the low. And um, he was humbling himself to the dust of the earth. And he believed, becoming a monk, that he was doing this to serve God. And so he was going to devote his full time, his full service to God. So he believed, well, um, this is how you best serve God is by by becoming a monk. This is how you best do it. So he was being very subservient, very humble um, toward God at this time, or at least he believed he was. So as he began to study um, under his tutors, 
um, it was a combination of a little bit of scripture and a lot of other books about law, about uh, or, or about uh, Catholic law, um, about the ap apostolic traditions. Um, there, were, there was a lot of study about Aristotle and Plato, um, and a lot of uh, things that had been inherited, uh, traditions of the fathers that had come down and had been adopted as um, the church's absolute doctrine and policy. And uh, one of those things that made him super uncomfortable was the practice of indulgences. And if you don't know what indulgences is, it is paying money for sins and even prepaying for future sins. So, for example, uh, you could receive forgiveness of sins. You, you say, well, you know, I, I swore or I, um, I looked with lust or I cheated or whatever. And so they would say, well, that is X number of dollars for that. And uh, not only that, but if you're going to do something in the future, and I see you've got a little bit of money there, then you can prepay for forgiveness of your sins. And so the the practice of indulgences became a huge money maker to the Catholic Church. And so the interesting thing is the the authorities, like the bishops and different people in the church, would go around to different cities, and they would set up a stand, and they would uh, have all the the people the the poor, the rich, everybody, they would say, come over here and you can receive forgiveness and pre-forgiveness for your sins. Um, and they would earn a large amount of money. Now, this didn't all go to the Pope because those who were selling it got to keep a portion of the earnings. And so the Catholic Church and the people who were selling this um, earned a lot of money. And they got very, very wealthy by doing this. And those who were better at selling um, got to be very, very rich. And Martin Luther saw this. Um, and so this practice of indulgences not only was for people who were alive, but they started to realize that because they had the keys of death and hell and purgatory, that they could tell people, look, we've got the keys. We can even unlock people from hell. So you, your, your son died early and he was, he was drinking and partying when he died and you're afraid he's in purgatory or hell. Well, we can pull him out of that. We can totally pull him out of that because we have the keys. All you need to do is pay a certain sum of money and you can free him. Um, and, and Luther, he balked to the idea that the church had power over heaven, hell, and purgatory. He's like, you <laughs> you really think you have power over hell and purgatory, really? Um, and, they said, and they said, yeah, you can save your dead. But did we mention there's a fee for saving it? So, and this might be really uncomfortable to you, but... Uh, we do have the 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 concept of you know we, we talk in the LDS Church about being saviors on Mount Zion. We talk about um, being able to do work on behalf of other people um, and how Jesus did that. And so they're saying, well, you can do that, and and your work is just equated to money. And so um, just pay us money, and you don't have to worry about your debt anymore. Isn't that interesting? There's a guy named uh, Johann uh, Tezel um, who um, coined this phrase, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from Purgatory Springs. Isn't that beautiful? So put that coin in the coffer, and you know that your, your wicked dead have been redeemed. And so uh, not only can you save yourself, but how many of your ancestors do you think are in pur Purgatory right now? Uh, what is that worth to you? Don't you think that's worth whatever amount of money? I mean, I know you need to eat, but is that really more important than than your dead, than saving them? So over time, Martin Luther began establishing some questions and some ideas about what was right and what was wrong, and he wanted to debate this. Now, we have uh, this thought that as he nailed the 95 Thesis up to the door of this cathedral, that he was being a super rebel guy, and and that was super rude for him to nail that to the door of the cathedral. But back in the day, as Eric Metaxas points out, that was probably kind of like pinning something to a bulletin board. Um, and Luther wasn't seeking to overthrow the Catholic Church at all. He wanted to have a debate. 
he's like, well, we can have this open debate about this idea. And everybody else is obviously going to come to an agreement with me because I think I've got really good arguments that go all the way back to the scriptures and Jesus. So he wanted to have a debate. That's why they're called the 95 Thesis. It's not 95 facts or, or whatever. He's just like, well, here's my thesis and anybody can argue with me and let's have a debate. So thesis number 45, I love this one. Christians are to be taught that he who sees a man in need and passes him by and gives his money for pardons purchase not, uh, purchases not the indulgences of the Pope, but the indignation of God. And you might think about the parable of the uh, Good Samaritan the Levite priest who passed by the guy who was needy. Um, and uh, you might also think about the parable of the sheep and the goats where Jesus says, in as much as you've done it to one of the least of these, you've done it to me. And in as much as you've not done it to one of these, you've not done it to me. And Luther is saying, if you're headed to go get a pardon for your sin through indulgences and you pass by any poor and needy, you're going to build the, the indignation of God because God doesn't work that way. Um, there's another one, thesis. This is not thesis 45. This is a mistake. But um, he says again, why does not the Pope, whose, whose wealth today is greater than the wealth of the richest Crassus, build this one basilica of St. Peter with his own money rather than build with the money of the poor believers? If you've been to St. Peter's, uh, or if you've been to the basilica of St. Peter's, yes. Um, wow. Um, amazing. And. Uh, Amazing the buildings that they have. If you've gone to Europe and looked at all the cathedrals there, it is amazingly impressive. I love going to those places and looking at the artwork. Um, the amount of money and time and skill, the decades that it would have cost to build those is super impressive. But then when you step out the door and you look at the old towns, some of those that were preserved, and the, the abject poverty of the people who were um, in the Middle Ages, living in poverty and building these massive, massive buildings for the church um, and on the back of their indulgences, on the back of paying for their sins. Um, the church was getting super wealthy. The clergy was getting super wealthy and the people were getting poorer and poorer and poorer. And this is what Martin, Martin Luther saw. This was him look, um, just looking at his conscience and going, this is not right. Something is wrong. I just came over this in chapter 55 of Isaiah. Um, the LDS Church, in the summary at the top, says, come and drink, salvation is free. Okay, so LDS Church says this is about salvation. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat, without money. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good." And let your soul delight itself in fatness. Okay, salvation really is free, but it wasn't in the Catholic Church. Alma taught to the people at the Waters of Mormon, he said, and thus they should impart their substance of their own free will and good desires toward God. Their own free will, not the will of the church, but their own free will. And to those priests that stood in needy, and to every needy, naked soul. So that's very consistent with what Martin Luther taught. And Isaiah. Um... However, in the LDS Church, we're, we're told, and this is Ronald Rasband, whether you have access to a temple or not, you need a current temple recommend to stay firmly on the covenant path. What does that temple recommend cost you? It costs you 10% of your income. Um, and then on the other hand, we still have poor and the needy that we pass by as we walk into the temple. Your temple recommend comes at a, a massive cost to the poor. And you might balk on that, at that and say, well, no, no, I pay fast offerings. Okay, do you pay 10% fast offerings? Or is it more like $50 or $10 or $100? But the cost to the poor and the needy who could use 10% of your income for whatever, because that would change the world. That would change the world if you put 10% of your income toward the poor and the needy. But yet we believe that our temple recommend is our ticket into the celestial kingdom. And so there, we have a lifetime of 10% of our income that is needed, we think, to get us salvation and to get salvation for our dead in the LDS church. Okay, let's talk about Martin Luther's concept of sola scriptura, or scripture alone. So Martin Luther, when as they had inherited all these ideas from Aristotle and Plato and from Catholic 
tradition, apostolic tradition, over 1,500 years, um, he would compare their teachings to Scripture, and he's like, um, it's plain as day in Scripture. It is plain as day. Um, we just need to be going into the Scripture, and we need to dispense with all this other tradition. Um, the basics that we need to know, salvation is taught in the Scriptures. And so he's coined this sola scriptura phrase here. Luther found that the church had gone astray from the scriptures and believed that he, if he could just show the people from the scriptures or even just convince people to read from the scriptures, then they would be convinced of the truth. But what he found, unfortunately, was that the people would not read from the scriptures. And so by choosing to ignore and remain ignorant of the scriptures, people by default chose to believe in the inerrancy of the church. And I find this today. Those people who are really in the scriptures begin to see this bigger picture and begin, begin to wake up to, oh, this is what Jesus taught. This is this is how salvation is supposed to work. This is how, this is the the real path that we're supposed to be on. This is how I go from faith to faith to faith, but from grace to grace. Um, and so we start to see that in the scriptures. But if all you do is go to church every week and you're not really in the scriptures, or you allow come follow me to tell you what the scriptures mean, or you just go to, to go to conference and bask in the nice talks that are there, which are nice. They are nice. Um, and they're soothing. And they make you feel good. And that's great. Um, but that's exactly what everybody in the day of Martin Luther was doing. They were just letting the leaders of the church tell them nice things. Um, they'd go to church. They'd be read to from the scriptures in Latin, which they didn't understand. Um, and they were selective because the church didn't want to read any scriptures that contradicted things like indulgences, um, that contradicted things like, well, they, they didn't want to read Isaiah that says, um, come ye and drink without money, without price. Um, they didn't want to read that and, and have to comment on that. Um, so they wouldn't. And so people who were not in the scriptures remained ignorant and remained very, very faithful to the Catholic church. Now we have in many different places in the scriptures, um, God admonishes us, for example, he says, he commands us to read Isaiah. We've been given a commandment in the Book of Mormon multiple times. Jesus said that. So did Moroni. So did Nephi. And we have lots of different places where we are directed back to the scriptures. It says, there you, you need to get back to the scriptures. And this scripture here in 1 Nephi 15, verse 24, I love this. And, I, and this is about the iron rod. And I said unto them that it was the word of God. And whoso would hearken unto the word of God and would hold fast unto it, they would never perish. Neither could the temptations of the fiery darts of the adversary overpower them unto blindness to lead them away to destruction. Okay, there's a lot of people that, that I read this and they go, oh, well, the iron rod is not really scripture. Okay, um, but it is, right? It is scripture. Yeah, but it's more than that. Well, I don't need scripture anymore because I, I just follow the spirit. Okay, um, you know, Martin Luther does have something to say about it, and we'll talk about it in a second. Uh, Joseph Smith, Matthew 1, Jesus says, And whoso treasureth up my word shall not be deceived. Okay, Both of these are saying, if you want to avoid deception and blindness and destruction and bondage, hold fast unto um, the word of God. Martin Luther said, Let nobody suppose that they have tasted the scripture sufficiently unless he has ruled it over the churches with the prophets for a hundred years. And he knows nobody is in that position. He's basically saying, look, don't ever stop going back to the Word of God in scriptures to, to get understanding. My own experience is that every time I read through the scriptures again, and I do it over and over and over again, I, I'm reading new scripture because God builds on what you already know. And he gives you more and more and more. So... Um, I love this quote. Unless I am convinced by proofs from the scriptures or by plain and clear reasons and arguments, I can and will not retract, for it is neither safe nor wise to do anything against conscience. Here I stand. I could do no other. God help me. Amen. So Martin Luther um, says we need to give proofs by scriptures, by plain and clear reason and arguments. Now, it's interesting that he says reason and argument is important. Um, there, there are people that that argue with me on some of my videos, and he said, well, you need to get this from the Spirit. Um, the Spirit works in your heart and in your mind. The Spirit actually teaches you through reason and argument so that you can teach other people through reason and argument and through the Spirit. When you share reason and argument with other people, the Spirit will confirm it and help cement that reason and argument there. 
but it has to be done with your mind. It has to be something that you can understand. It can't just be, hey, well, I felt this, and so you have to believe what I felt. Because that can always be manipulated, and it is manipulated a lot. And Martin Luther talked about, he said, it is neither safe nor wise to do anything against conscience. And Martin Luther, really cool guy, you can see he is a man that followed his conscience. And his conscience at the beginning said, go be a monk and go serve God. And so he went and did that. Go submit yourself to, the, to I mean, the best he knew was to submit himself to the church. So he did it. Okay. That was the best he could do with his conscience. And then what? And then he said, well, indulgences aren't right. Can we talk about it? Can we debate it? Um, and so he asked to do that. And it was more, it was just more and more and more. So his conscience, every time he would see something, he'd be willing to use reason and argument in his conscience and the scriptures, all three of those, to, to gain more light and knowledge. Okay, so this obviously brings into question, well, what about the keys that the Catholic Church says they got from Peter? And what about apostolic succession? And apostolic succession really is, is where they say, well, Peter gave the keys, he got the keys from Jesus, and then he gave the keys to the first pope, and then he gave it the next one, the next one, the next one. And so we've got a clear line of authority all the way down to the first, uh, all the way from the current pope down to the first pope to Peter and to Jesus. And so we have the keys, and so you better shut up and do what we say. That's apostolic succession. Well, it's a good thing we don't have that today, right? Oh, wait, we do? And it's it's even interesting in the LDS church, we claim this succession, and we claim that succession comes at the death of one prophet, and that automatically goes to the senior apostle. Um, it doesn't. We don't claim that it actually comes from God. Um, we're we're just like the Catholic Church, where it's like, well, it's handed down. It's handed down. These keys are handed down from one to the next to the next to the next. Um, very much the same. And because we have the keys, you you can't say anything against us because we have the keys. Um, this really brings to mind the idea of papal supremacy, which is totally a thing in the Catholic Church. Papal supremacy is the doctrine of the Catholic Church that the Pope, by reason of his office as vicar of Christ, you're, by reason of having the keys, he's he's the he's he's invested um, as the vicar of Christ, the visible source and foundation of the unity both of the bishops and the whole company of the faithful, and as pastor of the entire Catholic Church, has full, supreme, and universal power over the whole church, a power which he can always exercise unhindered. That, in brief, the Pope, the Pope enjoys by in divine institution supreme, full, immediate, and universal power in the care of souls, not only in this life, but the, the dead ones as well. Um, also, the concept of papal infallibility. The Catholic Church teaches that the Pope is infallible when he speaks ex cathedra, or from the chair of St. Peter, on matters of faith and morals. This infallibility is not because the Pope is without error in all of his statements, but because the Holy Spirit protects him from error in these specific instances. Does that sound familiar at all? Now, this is astounding. I hope that you're not only listening to this, but you zoom in and look at this. This is a quiz. I have a good friend who sent this to me a while back. His daughter was going to uh, BYU-Idaho and taking a religion class. And there's a quiz, and this is this is right along the lines of, of what we've been talking about. And this is a quiz about authority and who holds the right to do certain things in in the church and and even among everybody in the world today. Question number 14. Which members of the church have the right to interpret doctrine? Um, the correct answer is not elders, quorum instructors, or ward theologians, or general authorities, or members of the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve. It is only the First Presidency. That is, according to this, if you want to get credit, the right answer is only the First Presidency. They're the only ones that have the right to interpret doctrine. Holy cow. So Martin Luther would not have been accorded a debate, or he would not be accorded debate today. Not at all. It's only the First Presidency. They're the only ones who can give us interpret doctrine. That's it. Question 15. The, teachers of the, first, the teachings of the First Presidency are considered scripture. True or false? Well, if you want credit on this one, the answer is true. Really? All of them? 
Um, that's incredible. Okay, question 16. If we follow the leadership and teachings of the First Presidency, we will never go astray nor apostatize. We will gain peace in this life and inherit eternal glory. True or false? Well, if you want credit on this test, it's true. Um, I mean, I guess if you want to invest everything in the First Presidency and say, I'm putting all my eggs in that basket and I'm just going to follow them no matter what, and I'm not going to question anything, I'm not going to read the scriptures, or at least I'm going to let them interpret the scriptures for me and tell, tell me what they mean. But, oh my goodness, again, Martin Luther would have no place in our church today. Now let's talk a little bit about um, Martin Luther saw that the Catholic Church had this supreme control over so many aspects uh, people's spiritual lives. Uh, it wasn't only baptism, confirmation, and the sacrament, or Eucharist, or communion, but confession. Forgiveness of your sins was controlled absolutely by the Catholic Church. Anointing of the sick, that wasn't allowed by any um, layman. It, it was only the Catholic Church, the, the only ones who had the ability to anoint the sick and to heal. Um, holy orders, meaning... Uh, being able to be ordained, um, that was only, you only had the ability to do that within the church and with the authority and permission of the church. And then matrimony. Marriage was to be done within the church and divorce was not permitted, or if it was permitted, it would only be permitted through the Pope. And so pretty much your entire salvation, your entire spiritual life, um, you had no freedom or ability to get any of these gifts or abilities or permissions from God. It was all through the church um, because they had the keys, because they because the Pope reigns supreme and because hierarchy, because, of course, um, it has to be done through the hierarchy. And that's the only way. Well, Martin Luther was arguing, well, OK, I I get baptism. Yeah, we'll let the church do that and then give the sacrament. Yes. But all this other stuff. I don't believe that the only way that you can um, anoint and heal the sick or have the gifts of the Spirit to be able to do that are through the permission of the church. I don't believe that the only way that you can be ordained to something is only through the church. I don't believe that, that marriage should be controlled by the church. I don't believe that repent, repentance <coughs> or forgiveness of your sins, um, that the church should have... Uh, ultimate control over forgiveness of your sins. That's very controlling. I mean, if if they say you're not forgiven of this, then basically you're condemned to hell. And so they have, again, the church is exercising uh, ability to condemn you to hell or not. That's a lot of power. Now, now we think that we're different, but my goodness, um, the covenant path has pretty much all of these elements here. Um, and we say that these are all embodied in the LDS church. It's not only baptism and confirmation and um, the sacrament. Um, it's also, as we see at the top, priesthood confirmation or conferral and ordination. Okay. That's holy orders. Um, blessings for the sick. Um, we have uh, marriage, uh, temple sealing, uh, eternal life. Um, all of these things, we have adopted the exact same things. And we say, you, you can't get these directly from God. You can't, it's not free. You have to go through the church to get that. And what's required? Well, definitely you're going to have to have temple recommend. Definitely you're going to have to be paying tithing. Definitely you're going to have to submit to the authority of the church. Definitely you're going to have to sustain the leaders of the church, meaning accept what they say um, in order to be able to, to get any of this stuff. And yes, we can reject your temple ceiling. Yes, we can take away um, your ceiling to your children. Yes, we can take away your priesthood. Um, yes, we can uh, reject uh, your your repentance. And we have the authority to say whether or not you have been forgiven or not. And we have the ability to, um, to make it so that you can't uh, partake of the sacrament or the Eucharist or the communion anymore. So it's very much... The same thing. All of this stuff has been embodied 
um, more and more and more in the LDS Church. This is, I would say, Catholic Church 2.0. I mean, Martin Luther would say that, wouldn't he? Again, you probably this is probably very uncomfortable for a lot of people. And again, it's you would hate Martin Luther. You really would. Martin Luther started realizing that it's not just about blind obedience. It's not just about getting in the box and doing what the church tells you to do, but it is about faith and that faith had been redefined and misdefined. Um, faith, um, he saw this quote in Romans 1.17, famously, he, um, this is one of the big scriptures that he loved, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So he's like, well, what does that mean, faith to faith? Um, because faith, we, we define it as, well, do you have enough faith just to um, do everything the prophet tells you to do? Do you have enough faith to stay in, in the mainstream of the church? Do you have enough faith to just stay on the covenant path? And it basically means get in the box and don't question and, and blind obedience. Or maybe not blind obedience. You know, read your scriptures and stuff like that, but don't ever go outside the lines that, that are, have been dr drawn by the church. And that's exactly what the Catholic Church said in his day. So this concept of faith to faith to faith is, um, and for Martin Luther, he's like, well, my conscience told me this. And so he did that. And so that is him going to the first faith. And then his conscience would point out something else. And that's, and so he would do that. And that's going to the next faith. And then his conscience would point out something else. And this wasn't just his conscience. We, we talk about the light of Christ, which is our conscience, which is, is really the Holy Spirit that's talking to us. It's really within us, God, God's voice to us. And so if you live by your conscience, like Martin Luther does, then you'll go from faith to faith to faith. And as you start to see things in the scriptures and you start to understand better God, he will show you the next step. And that's going from faith to faith. So Martin Luther began to realize that righteousness is living by faith to God and to your conscience. Now, Martin Luther we consider him this, this guy who did amazing, amazing things and total hero, but he didn't get there in one day. Um, like I said, he submitted himself as a monk early on and he was just going to be, he started out, he was just going to be blindly obedient to the church. And then he started seeing things. And he's like, well, I got to point that out. And so he'd point that out and he's like, let's have a debate on this. Let's talk about this because this is not right. This is hurting the poor and the needy. This is wrong. This is not against, not according to the scripture. And so he would do that. From faith to faith to faith. This is line upon line. For behold, thus saith the Lord God, I will give unto the children of men line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, and blessed are those who hearken unto my precepts, and lend an ear unto my counsel, for they shall learn wisdom, for unto him that receiveth I will give more. And from them that shall say, We have enough, from them shall be taken away even that which they have. So again, God says, I, you know, if you won't harden your heart, I will work a reformation among you. Okay? He wants to do that in your heart. He wants to reform you. Reformation is a godly thing. He wants to teach you from faith to faith to faith, line upon line, precept upon precept, and he wants to give you wisdom. And if you take some wisdom, then he'll give you more. And this was Martin Luther, uh, a little bit at a time. And so you, you can see this progression of Martin Luther. I really encourage you to read this book. From the beginning um, to the end, he was a vastly different person, and even... In the middle, he was, he was a very different person. He just kept getting better and better and better. Now he didn't get everything right. Nobody, nobody gets everything right. He, but he did as best he could according to his conscience. And um, we love to think of him as a hero. But again, as I said at the beginning of this, if Martin Luther was alive today, you totally hate him and completely consider him a child of hell, because he was asking questions that monks shouldn't ask. They had no authority. He was a heretic. He was excommunicated. He was an apostate. Um, and what right had he to question the Lord's anointed? That's the Pope. Lord's anointed. Question God? How dare you? Can we find any reformers in the scriptures like Martin Luther? Um, there's probably none. Well, except we do have that Jesus guy who came and he was among the church, the Pharisees, Sadducees, Sanhedrin. And he's like, this is, this is wrong. You guys are doing this and... Um, and so he would point out things, and he was definitely hated for it. We also have the Moses guy, um, who 
tried to work a reformation among people in his day. Um, Abraham saw the church in apostasy, and Abraham um, worked a reformation in himself. Um, you see that at the beginning of the book of Abraham, where he said that he desired to have the blessings of the fathers, and he desired to be a man of righteousness. And so Martin Luke, or Abraham, during the 120 plus years of his life, you can see how he went uh, line upon line and faith to faith until when he was um, 99 years old, he finally began to receive the promises that he'd, he had been given at the beginning, or at least early on, because he wanted to come out from apostasy. He wanted to come out from the idolatry that he lived among. <clears throat> we also have Lehi, who was a big part of the church of his day, and he was told to come out of that and to preach repentance. And he was preaching reform. He says, we have to reform this. We need to repent. That's what repent is. It's reform. Let's 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 change the wicked things that we're doing and let's make them better. Um, <clears throat> Lehi, big time. We have Jeremiah also, same thing. Uh, Jeremiah was trying to reform the church. And over decades, he was doing that. Joseph Smith, again, he's the one who delivered that revelation in the Book of Commandments. That was from God saying, I will work a reformation among you if you harden not your hearts. Paul, now that Paul's a great example because Paul, um, he disagreed with Peter. Well, that's interesting. Um, can you disagree with Peter? Peter holds the keys. Is that okay? Well, yeah, it is okay. Paul would have discussions and arguments with Peter and say, look, um, you're telling people that they need to be circumcised and, um, I don't think that God requires that. And so we even have um, Martin Luther qu quoting Paul saying that people need to live from faith to faith to faith. And so Paul was working a reformation trying to say, well, do, do we keep all the Jewish traditions that we had? Um, or is there a new gospel here? Is there a new way? Um, we have Alma Senior, who was in apostasy among uh, the people of King Noah Abinadi came and Alma Sr., because Abinadi didn't want to change, neither did the other priests, he worked a reformation among the people and helped them to repent. We have Mormon, um, also born into a church of almost complete apostasy. We have Samuel in the Old Testament, Elijah, Elisha, and John the Baptist, Noah, Enoch, Melchizedek, all of these men of God, all of our great I mean, these really are Mormon heroes. Are these really the people that we we claim to idolize these people and we claim, oh, these are the best of the best and I want to be just like them? Really? Um, do you really want to be like them? Because it it makes people super uncomfortable to do anything like what these, these men of God did. Lots of people claim to love Martin Luther, but they would usually claim it decades or even centuries later. Basically, they had no skin in the game. They didn't want to take any risks. It's really risky to, to speak against the church. Um, most of these people who followed him were still sheep. They just, instead of following a Catholic church, they they just followed Martin Luther and, just, and, and did what everybody else was doing. They weren't really willing to reform themselves, um, and they really weren't willing to even read the scriptures. So the question is, and it's really hard because people just want to be told what to do. People want to arrive. They don't want to have to change. They want to, to say, yeah, I got the right answers. And so generally, we are sheep um, that, that just want to be told what to do. The question is, where is the spirit of Martin Luther today? Martin Luther talked about a free market of ideas. Um, this is where in our Bill of Rights, um, we have the right to free speech. And basically the free market of ideas. This, um, a lot of this originated from the time and person of Martin Luther. Dissent is necessary. There's no other way to get to the truth unless somebody can, can argue against that. Um, through dissent, um, experimentation, ideas, searching. So we have an all-powerful God that doesn't force us to believe in him. And he doesn't force dogma on us. I um, mean, he doesn't force us to accept his ideas without evidence, and yet we believe that somehow he's going to um, force us through a church to do that. God tells us in Scripture to come and eat and drink freely of the bread and water of life without money and without price. So why did the Catholic Church 
end up ruling with an iron fist? Well, because of priestcrafts, uh, money. Um, and that's why Martin Luther, ultimately, um, he had to talk about money because that was a big problem. That was keeping the poor and the needy, poor and needy. Um, and there was unchecked power um, because they seized on the ignorance of the masses who had no idea about what the scripture said. Um, so we say, oh, you know, bad Catholic church, bad, super bad. Oh my gosh, they're so evil, so bad. But we're not really willing to consider whether or not reformation is needed in our day. So on the one hand, we have uh, the, the the papal or pope infallibility on the Catholics. I got it the wrong here, but the, we say, or they said that the, the pope is infallible. They said, well, we've got apostolic succession, which means we've got a direct line of authority. We had uh, money that's taken as payment for sins, um, which is indulgences. They said, well, you can save your wicked dead too, as long as you give money to the church. They would say all keys and authority belong to the church. You can't do anything outside of that. You want priesthood, you got to get it through us. You want gifts of the spirit, well, you got to come to us. Um, doctrine can only be understood or interpreted by the Pope. Um, scripture is really secondary to whatever the Pope says, uh, because he he's supreme. He sits in the in the seat of Saint Peter. Um, so the Church, the Catholic Church, built vast vast wealth, and the 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 public or the poor and the needy are overlooked. And you can go to Europe and you can see that um, in in the all the little towns around there that have these massive cathedrals and had poverty like crazy among the ignorant masses. The church exerted massive control over its people. So it's a good thing we don't have that today, right? Well, we kind of do. We say, follow the prophet. He can't possibly lead you astray. Um, we've got a line of authority all the way back to Joseph Smith and to, to, to Jesus, um, to uh, Peter, James, and John and everything else. So we've got this line of authority, so you better obey us because, because we said Instead of just taking money for payment for sins, um, we ask for 10% of your ongoing income for ordinances. Um, you know, we've, we've realized in, in this day that, that subscription-based things are much more profitable than one-time payment. And uh, I guess the, um, the marketing and sales technique of the churches has improved since the day of the Catholics, where you could just go pay... Uh, a one-time payment for whatever sins, but uh, now you just, you need to, Temple recommend, you need 10% ongoing all the time to make sure that you're going to get into the gate of the Sludge Kingdom because you never know when you're going to die. And you don't want that Temple recommend to expire. Also, you, you need to be giving a 10% of your income and you need to be continually doing saving ordinances for all of your dead. Um, so that is hugely, hugely, hugely expensive. And it's no wonder that the LDS Church is... Um, one of the richest organizations on the face of the earth. Um, we also say, just like Catholics, all, Catholics did, all keys and authority belong to the church. We also say the doctrine can only be interpreted by the First Presidency, nobody else. Martin Luther, you have no, you have no ability to say this. God would never tell you um, this because this can only come through the First Presidency. We say, old prophets. Don't get better with time, and definitely scripture and the old prophets are secondary to the prophet. So the church builds vast wealth, and the poor and the needy are overlooked, and the church exerts massive control over its people. So Catholic Church 2.0, really. Again, back to Ecclesiastes, the thing that has been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done saying it's already happened, and guess what? There's no new thing under the sun. It's going to happen again. Are you going to learn? Is there any new? Is there anything wherever it may be said, see, this is new, it hath been already of old time, which was before us. So this test, we keep having this test over and over and over and over and over again in history, and the preacher here in Ecclesiastes is saying, are you, are you going to finally, finally learn? Again, back to the Book of Commandments, chapter 4, and thus, if the people of this generation will harden not their hearts, I will work a reformation among them. And I will put down all lies and deceivings and priestcrafts and envyings and strifes and idolatries and sorceries and all manner of iniquities. And I will establish my church like unto the church, which was taught by my disciples of old in the days of old. God wants reformers. 
God sends reformers. God sent Martin Luther. God is a reformer. God wants you to be a reformer. God wants you to reform yourself. He wants you to reform your family. He wants you to reform um, your ward and the people around you. He wants to work a reformation among us. He sends a reformation. He, he's a reformer. I love what Joseph Smith said to the Relief Society in 1842. President Smith rose, read the 14th chapter of Ezekiel. Um, and, and by the way, that says, in Ezekiel, he says, I will give you up unto multitude of your idols. Said the Lord had declared by the prophet that the people should each one stand for himself and depend no, on no man or man in the state of the corruption of the Jewish church. Okay, Joseph saying, look, have we been through this before? The Jewish church got corrupted. Catholic church got corrupted. That the righteous persons could only deliver their own souls. Applied it to the present state of the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Are you kidding me? So Joseph is saying that we're in the same conundrum that the Jewish church was, that the Catholic church was in. He said, if the people departed from the Lord, they must fall. That they were depending on the prophet, hence were darkened in their minds from neglect of themselves. Work a freaking restoration within yourself, is what Joseph is saying. Do you have the spirit of Martin Luther? I love the scripture, Isaiah 52 talking about picking yourself up out of that. This is something of God. Awake, awake, put on a strength, O Zion, put on a beautiful garment, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. And here it is. Are you in bondage? Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyselves from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Why do you loose yourself from the bands on your neck? What does that mean? Do you have bands on your neck? It means you're a slave. It means you're letting somebody else lead you around by the neck. And he's telling people in the last days, O captive daughter of Zion, you're supposed to be Zion, but you're captive. And he's telling us in the last days, and you can read this, I think it's in DNC 113, the interpretation of this. What are the bands? Um, he's saying, take them off. Free yourself and take on the power of God. For thus saith the Lord, ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. So, question, do we have the spirit of Martin Luther? Um, are we doing the works of Martin Luther? Are we doing the works of Jesus? Are we doing works of the, the reformers from, from the beginning? Or do we just say, no, it's different this time. We just need to get inside the box, stay in the box, and do um, what the leaders tell us. Well, if you're saying that, you're saying, well, keep those bands on your neck and, uh, you know, don't shake yourself from the dust and sit down and don't arise. It's kind of the opposite of what Isaiah says. No wonder uh, Jesus commands us to read Isaiah.